Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Wish, and I'm a musicologist and adjunct lecturer at the Jacobs School of Music here in Bloomington, Indiana. This afternoon, I am joined by Karine Cuellar Vendon, who is the founding member of the Jimenez Quartet. And thank you so much for joining us, Karine. Could you tell us maybe where you're joining us from? Yeah, thank you so much, Christine. Very glad to be here and very happy to be able to present uh, the Jimenez Quartet at the Bloomington Early Music Festival. I'm joining you from Montreal, uh, Quebec in Canada. Wonderful, thank you so much for being here. So this is a new, a fairly new quartet um, and I understand that you all have had just a wonderful year um, as an emerging artist with Early Music America. Could you tell me a little bit about the formation of the Jimenez Quartet, maybe why you've taken this name as the Jimenez Quartet and what brought you all together? Sure, um, I started researching the music of Jimenez Quartet as part of my degree at uh, McGill University and decided to assemble a uh, group so then we can uh, so then we can perform all the music that I was researching and for me the format of the string quartet was an ideal format being that uh, Jimenez has uh, three surviving complete string quartets and a lot of chamber music so then the the quartet would have been the center or the seat for many other um, formats of, uh, of music. So then we, we founded this string quartet in 2019, right before the pandemic. Our first concert actually was in February, 2020, like two or three weeks <laughs> before the pandemic was declared. And, um, and we assemble a group of uh, like-minded musicians. Uh, we are all committed to uh, the mission of bringing lesser known composers to the stage. And in a way that it's informed and sensitive. So then uh, we uh, work very far from exoticisms or tokenism. So then we, we are very um, aware of bringing this music in the best possible manner to the highest uh, level uh, possible as well and informed by research. And we are all specialists in performance practices and historically informed performance practices. So this came very easy to us. And we work on the music of Jimenez, but we also work on other composers uh, from the Americas, especially, but also from Europe, women composers and, and composers of color. So that's something that guides uh, our work. Um, the members of my quartet are Simon Alexandre, he's uh, the second violin, uh, Jimin Dobson, the violist, and Jessica Korotkin on cello. Wonderful. I am so excited. I, look, I can't wait to hear this concert. Um, so we've mentioned the name Jimenez. This is Pedro Jimenez Abril Tirado. And he is a name that for years historians knew only really by name because there were references and you know, contemporary references to this composer who was like the Rossini of the Americas. But it's only recently that we've really gotten to know his music. So I'm wondering, could you talk about your introduction to his music and how, how the world is now coming to get to know some of his music, especially in the last maybe decade or so. Yeah, we need to thank um, the work of uh, musicologist Jose Manuel Izquierdo because he really brought Jimenez to, well, to the world. He wrote a, a PhD dissertation at Cambridge University on the works of Jimenez and Jose Manuel, uh, uh, sorry, Jose Bernardo Alcedo, um, Peruvian, another Peruvian uh, composer that lived in Chile, uh, comparing both of their outputs um, in trying to, to have them in a conversation, uh, questioning like what were their choices and the appropriations being that both of them lived in this period called the age of revolutions. Mm. And um, due to you know, the work that he did, then we are able to uh, access the music of Jimenez as well. Um, because he also completed a, a second uh, critical catalog of the music of Jimenez in Bolivia. And of course, I, well, I heard of Jimenez uh, as a result of the work of, of Jose Manuel Izquierdo. And my first question was like, yeah, what, what music for violin is there? Right. And, and then I was able to you know, do the same kind of work, the archival, archival research in Bolivia and find all these gems you know, in, for chamber music, symphonies. He has 40 symphonies. He has many divertimenti concertanti for diverse instrumentation, string quartets, flute quartets, and there are sonatas for solo instruments. So then the, the output is very vast um, and there's so much work that can be done in his music. 
So his music can be used not only, you know, to, to, to see what was happening in the continent uh, related to music production, but also the, the musical influences, the, the tendency, the tastes, and, um, and also the, the, the work of Jimenez, uh, who lived during this period called the Age of Revolution. So he was born in 1784 and died in 1856. So he lived through the whole uh, era of uh, the wars of independence and also when the, the republics gained uh, that um, gained freedom from the Spanish colonial rule. So then his output reflects all these changes in, uh, in tastes and in musical uh, aesthetics of the time. And this is something that, um, that is, you know, invaluable for, for us musicians and musicologists and performers, because before maybe we didn't have access to such prolific work. Um, there are so many names and there are so many other composers uh, in this uh, region and from the same time period. But the presence of A. Jimenez, who has such a prolific output there, uh, shows us that you know there's nothing we 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 can envy or we have to envy um, Europe for uh, relating to to music production and only studying the the work of Jimenez that it you know it, it it will require a lot of a lot of time and and I I'm just in happy to to be able to contribute to the world with a little bit of um, the, this music so then you know we know of his name and we know of his his work. It's wonderful. I, I'm so excited about this. Um, I should perhaps tell our audience here um, in case they're unfamiliar with this. So it's only the reason I mentioned about the 15 years and you're talking about how there's so much work to be done is that we didn't have music for him for until this discovery of you described it as a closet of materials that are that were being cataloged. So what has the process been for you getting to know these quartets um, and the, the first piece on the program you've mentioned is an arrangement. Could you talk a little bit, um, I guess, about the sources? Uh, we can get into the specifics of the music in a moment for the, these particular pieces, but what the sources are like and what, what is the work that is to be done and where, where you hope to take some of your, both the performance and the scholarship? Yeah, um, I maybe mentioned it by passing, but yes, uh, his music was only discovered a little over than a decade ago. And it was just by chance in a closet in a house someone inherited in Sucre, Bolivia. And yeah, before we only had mentions of him, but then we had all the work and I was able to see all of it uh, in my visits to the archives in Bolivia. And all his music survives in part forms. They are not uh, scores at all. And the, the problem with this discovery is that his music uh, was sold by the kilo or by the bunch. So then much of the parts are um, distributed or have been you know, mixed with other music. So then the work of trying to compile together a whole piece uh, or a whole set of parts um, uh, is part of the, the work that we need to do as performance if we have to perform this, we want to perform this music. So then that is, that's the work that um, as a performer, we need, to, we need to do what I have done, <clears throat> finding the parts for a quintet in one of the collections or in another library in, <clears throat> or you know, uh, in different uh, circumstances. So then his music of course survives in manuscript form. He wasn't able to publish music because at this time there were not uh, printings in, in South America. We know of the first printing maybe in 1825 in Bolivia and that was the first uh, newspaper that was printed in a couple of months after the, the, the independence of the country, but it wasn't used for music uh, until the later part of the, of the 19th century. So then most of his music survives in manuscript form, besides one piece that was um, printed in Paris and came back to South America. He never left South America, so all his music and his fame uh, stayed in uh, within the you know the, the the continent. And so then the work that I do when I go to the archives is not just look at his music, but I also survey the newspapers of the time, trying to look for references for house concerts or opera concerts or or uh, salon gatherings be because they were all advertising the newspapers. But also I look at the um, church or at the ca uh, cathedral logs 
which it was, you know, every day they will write about all the activities that they will do during the day. And among them, then there will be mentions of the orchestra, the cathedral, which Jimenez uh, directed in Sucre in Bolivia. Jimenez was born in Arequipa at, uh, in 1784, but around 18, 1833, because he was so famous in the area, in the region, um, he was hired by the third president of Bolivia to become the chapel master in Sucre, Bolivia. So then all his music survives in Sucre. And um, so then these, you know, cathedral logs are very useful for finding out, you know, who were the musicians in the orchestra, how much they got paid, what kind of instruments they used, because there are all these, you know, uh, references to, to buying the instrument, to instrument purchases, but also to the pieces when they were performed or premiered or, or commissioned for different uh, religious uh, festivities. So then looking at this material or these sources actually uh, opens up, you know, a new world of um, context for the music because he never signed a, a compositional date, for example, in his pieces. So then we do this work of tracing uh, through the cathedral logs to find out uh, when he composed such piece. And also, you know, that all that work, what it does is to give us a, a more global understanding of the context of the composition on the performance of the pieces and also the ideas uh, that were uh, circulating in these circuits, in the salons or in the in the theater. So then uh, that helps us also um, uh, feed our imagination uh, at the time of the performance. Wonderful. Thank you. So we've talked about how he, um, how this music was found in Sucre, but the program's pieces that we have for this afternoon's performance seem to come from the earlier part of his life. And you've titled this concert Pedro Jimenez's Salon. So what I wanted to ask you is, would you, could we talk a little bit about um, what is the atmosphere like? We, he is someone, so Jimenez is a composer who, as you mentioned, is developing during this age of revolutions um, as, the, as the colonies, the American colonies are gaining their independence from Spain. So we have on the ground this very, this nationalist um, and an independence movement that is being expressed in the, in the music. And something that I, as a musicologist, am interested in, but the, that I'm also always talking to my students about and to others, is how when we talk about Latin American music, we so often think about the nationalist movement as a 20th century phenomenon. And we're thinking about Chavez, and we're thinking about Revueltas, or we're thinking about um, Ginastera or Villalobos, but we're not thinking necessarily about nationalism or even local identities expressed in music necessarily in the 19th century. And so what you have here in this program, as I see it, is really a wonderful um, pairing of works that are expressing, I don't want to say a dual identity, but certainly a combination or a negotiation of local elements with a yearning for cosmopolitan ideas and a, a, a notion of wanting to be part of the inherited, I'll call it the European tradition, but what is an inherited classical art tradition. So I'm wondering, could we talk a little or can, about um, maybe the salon environment, what we know um, Jimenez was doing with his salon, and then a little bit about some of the aesthetics that we're seeing in these two pieces, or these two, um, two collections of pieces for this afternoon's performance? Of course, you're totally right. Um, these pieces were most likely composed in the time while he was still in Arequipa, so before 1830s, and maybe the first decades of the 19th century. He was known in Arequipa for hosting uh, the Tertulias Literarias, it was a salon gathering, but also it was a place for political debate. Um, we know uh, from, from sources that he was even one of the uh, officials or witnesses to that signed it for the independence uh, of Peru or in one of the documents of independence mm -hmm. in Peru. So then we know that he was very active in this process of, of uh, enabling this, this, this political discussion. So one, so his salon gatherings were, you know, part of this. Um, and it was in these salon gatherings that he premiered his, his pieces and the, the music that we have decided to present in the concert today are precisely like the, uh, the Cuarteto Concertante para dos violines, viola y violoncello, opus 55, a string quartet that um, was, com was composed to be performed at the salon gatherings with him playing the cello. He was 
both uh, guitar and cello, uh, a very able guitar and cello player. So um, what the audience will be able to see in the Quarteto Concertante is, well, this, this style, which is the concertant style uh, that originated in France and was able to arrive in, in the Americas through, you know, uh, thanks to the Bourbonic reforms, which allowed uh, the free commerce of many ports uh, between Americas and, and Spain and allowed also um, an opening of the material that was, you know, been circulating. So among them, secular works and secular music. So, so he had access to the music of Pleyel, of Cambini, of Boccherini, but also Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven. But it seems that he was taking more into the, 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 the Parisian classical style. So that was the style that he chose for his uh, compositions. So uh, we are able to find the concertant style in his symphonies, in his string quartets, mm -hmm. in some of the sacred pieces. Um, so then the idea of the concertant style is, is that uh, every member of the ensemble has a, or shares the melodic action. So then uh, in the first movement of the string quartet, uh, every member of the quartet gets uh, a solo or gets many solos, but with the caveat that of course the cello solo is the most flamboyant one because well, Jimenez was playing it. And um, the second movement of the string quartet it was written, now we go into this, this area of the local uh, sounds and the local genres, which Jimenez champions in his music. He's able to combine both um, in an equal manner. So then the second movement is written in the form of Ayerabi, even though it's called Adagio con Sordina, uh, the form can be uh, distinguished by the, the well, the, the song genre, the Yarabi, it's associated with the Harawi, which is a pre-Columbian song genre uh, from the Inca tradition. But as time passed, uh, it was appropriated by the Criollos and Mestizos, and uh, Spanish poetry was used with uh, this uh, song genre. And by the time of the independence revolutions, then the Yarabi had uh, become like a staple of the independence cause. And so then the Yarabi, uh, well, in this quartet was, you know, part of that, that idea of the uh, representing the yearning of freedom or the yearning of a new, a new beginning. Mm -hmm. And the Yarabi as a song genre was usually sung with two singers singing usually in parallel thirds and accompanied by the guitar. So this could be uh, heard in the version for string quartet that Jimenez uh, has here in the There's also quartet. some ornamentation, right? That you've talked about elsewhere, like characteristic ornamentation that also gives it some Yarvi moments. Is that, did I understand that right from some program notes earlier? Yes, and it's, is it is a ornamentation that is quite peculiar and the, the, mm -hmm. the listener will be able to see that, that is not really uh, expected. <laughs> and also uh, the phraseology is not uh, even or is not symmetrical. So it really relates to, to text. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something that distinguishes Ayarabi from say a uh, theme of variation, theme with variations that could have been or a through composed second movement, which it was the norm uh, at that time. And the Minuet Allegro is, is a minuet, uh, I would think that you know a normal minuet just slightly longer Mm -hmm. and the, but the rondo is pretty much what we may have uh, associated Jimenez with, which is the, the, the Italian, the uh, comic opera. Right. And, and you mentioned that, yes, he was nicknamed the, the Rossini of the Americas. So then we can hear this, uh, these elements of the Commedia dell'arte in this movement, in this rondo, as well as in the Allegro of this string quartet. The other piece uh, with uh, which we start the program, uh, which is called Suite Andina, is not an actual composition of Jimenez in the sense that he didn't compose this suite as is, but this is a compilation of movements from his pieces that have this local flavor. So then the first movement, the Yarabi, is taken from a, uh, from a set of uh, paraliturgical pieces uh, composed for the observance of the quinario. These are the salutaciones a las cinco llagas de Jesús and or en meditaciones para el quinario. The quinario was the observance of the five holy wounds of Christ and it was celebrated around uh, Easter time. So this is a piece originally for two flutes and string quartet and here arranged for a string quartet. 
the vals are still americano and here is the part where i want to tap on what you were mentioning about the negotiation between wanting to be part of this cosmopolitan language this cosmopolitan world but also bringing a, a personal or a or a um and unique voice mm -hmm. so then during the first decade of the 19th century, and we find this in, in texts for patriotic songs, uh, what it was yearned was this idea of the American freedom, the, the feeling of the, the being American. Um, so it wasn't yet Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, right? So it wasn't yet as the nationalistic movement that we know of in the 20th century, even late 19th century, in which we want to be really Brazilian or distinctively Chilean. But in the beginning of the 19th century, we want to be American, distinguishing ourselves from Europe, from Europe, right? Or from anything European. So then this vals al estilo americano, it's uh, I want to believe an, an a domestication of the European genre, the, the waltz, but with that color or that sound of that for him was the American sound, which in this case will sound like um, Andean music uh, with pentaphonic uh, sonorities, mm -hmm. with parallel uh, octaves, uh, and things that we may not do, for example, in um, Western classical music. So then something that it's uh, identifiable, identifiable as American in you know, the first decades of the 19th century. And the last movement of this suite is the Gallinacito, uh, which is a dance uh, genre that was very popular in the first decades uh, of the 19th century and originated in the late 18th century. But it's a genre that uh, got extinct and, and we, you know, we don't have any more references of Gallinacitos after mid 19th century. But there are references to Gallinacitos in the newspapers in the first decades of the uh, 19th century. And well, this, this dance would sound very similar to other uh, Latin American dances that currently survive like the Huapango in Mexico or the Cueca in Mexico, in Bolivia and Chile, the Chacarera in Bolivia and Argentina, for the combination of a, of a triple and duple sense uh, of the rhythm. It's right. written usually in 6-8, uh, but we often switch to 3-4. Sure. So then, yeah, there's the, the constant presence of emiolas. Right. And um, so that's the kind of sound. And what is characteristic of this dance specifically is uh, the rhythm of four eight notes and a quarter. So it will sound like ta 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 something very you know mm -hmm. that comes from from uh, that has origins in Spanish uh, genres like the Andalusian fandango. So that's the gallinacito, and that's the that will be the last moment of this suite. Perfect. Wonderful. That is so helpful. Um, we're coming up upon time. And I'm just last question for you. What do you want the audience to take away and or what's next? What it, as, as the audience is listening to this, what do you want them to take away? And then what's next for you? What do you take away from this? Well, for us, as, as the Jimenez Quartet, we are just starting in our work on bringing the music of Jimenez and other uh, lesser known composers or underrepresented composers. And uh, our idea is that this music uh, can, not well, our mission is that um, we, we present this music in a way that doesn't need to be nor exoticized nor tokenized for it to be taken seriously in the sense that Jimenez and other composers from Latin America, and uh, they deserve you know, a place in our programs, they deserve a place in our stages, they deserve a place in our music curriculums, because they do reflect the ways you know, society worked and developed in past years. Um, we usually in performance practice, we focus in a couple of names when we talk about music of the 19th century. So what we really want to do is to show, you know, one more person, one more composer uh, that could represent this time period and these uh, these styles and these aesthetics in in the Americas. So what I would like uh, to leave the audience is, you know, this seed of curiosity, so then they can go on and and look more more music of, of Jimenez and more music by other Latin American composers of the period. So then we start really uh, expanding our knowledge of um, music production in other places than, than Europe. 
That's Jimenez was definitely the most prolific South American composer of the 19th century. And, um, and we think that he deserves to be known by, by more people than the Jimenez. 100% agree. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you look at it, he is very much a window to this, like very much a starting point, a, a big starting point, but certainly a starting point. So thank you so very much. Um, thank you for joining us and enjoy the concert. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine.